Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. I think we'll have some fun tonight. Our guest, Gary Steingart, is the author of six books, and he has joined us for most of them, including Absurdistan, named a Best Book of the Year by numerous periodicals, the New York Times bestseller, Super Sad True Love Story, and Lake Success, a critically acclaimed satire of the emptiness of materialism. He's also the author of the National Book Critics Circle Award finalist, Little Failure, a memoir of his experiences in the dramatically dissimilar worlds of consumerist America and the perpetually deprived Soviet Union of his youth. His latest novel, Our Country Friends, prompted this review in the New York Times. The book is a perfect novel for these times and all times, the single textual artifact from the pandemic era I would place in a time capsule as a representation of all that is good and true and beautiful about literature. That comes from Molly Young. Tonight, Gary will be in conversation with Laura McGrath, Assistant Professor of English at Temple University. Please welcome Gary Steingart and Laura McGrath to the Free Library. Good evening. It's so nice to see so many of you here, and I'm so excited to be chatting with our guest, Gary Steingart, this evening about Our Country Friends. I hope you all have had the pleasure of reading this novel. I loved this novel. Oh, thank you. Thank um, you. In so many ways, I think Our Country Friends is a real departure from some of your other writing, mm. and in so many ways, I think it's really quite similar. Mm. Um, and so I thought we might begin by talking about the most obvious point of departure for this book, uh, which is the conditions under which it was written, uh, the reason why some of you are masked here this evening. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so talk about the pandemic. Uh, talk about this pandemic novel. Yeah, um, great to be back at the Free Library. Hope you can all hear me. Um, yeah, every book I've been here, it's great. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is also a very nice trip to see all the new things Philly has, like that nice big bar at the Four Seasons. You should yeah. check it out. <laughs> it's really something. It's like Dubai. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very surprised by it. Um, yeah, so I went into the pandemic, uh, March 2022. I went into it with a novel pretty much two-thirds done, or at least the first draft, and it was going to be a kind of academic satire, very New York oriented, in which uh, NYU, the university, New York University, takes over Manhattan mm -hmm. and uh, uh, forces almost everyone out. And it has its own army, um, <laughs> builds, builds a wall around Manhattan Island. Uh, but it was very kind of, you know, because I've been teaching at Columbia for the last, I don't know, 800 years. Uh, so it was kind of an academic satire. Um, of which we used to have a lot of uh, writers. There were entire writers who devoted their whole careers to academic satires, like uh, David Lodge. Remember David Lodge? Uh, yeah, you do, see. Um, but now there's less of that, and I thought, eh, you know, I'll have some fun with that. But as the pandemic started, I became, um, I, I thought that the kind of gentle satirical dystopia I was describing in um, this book was eclipsed, really, by what was happening in, in the world which was the pandemic. Um, so I s kind of abandoned that novel. I, I rarely do that, but I was about 240 pages in. And I, I think what scared me was this combination of, A, the pandemic itself, but also the political response to it, this very incompetent sort of Soviet-grade response <laughs> to the pandemic. And uh, of course, you know, I, I, I'm a good citizen. I did everything the president said. I, I took a lot of bleach. I. I <laughs> I dewormed myself many times. I, I tried sun therapy, and um, I guess it worked. I guess he was right, because I didn't catch it. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, <laughs> but I started writing it also because I was uh, uh, upstate, uh, just like the main, the main the narrator of the book. I was uh, upstate uh, in a little like dacha-like space, uh, where I now spend about half the year. So I feel as comfortable there as I do in New York. Actually, I feel more comfortable. I could. I could live there if I didn't have a kid in school in New York, I would probably leave. Um, so I was uh, living up there and I was reading a lot of Chekhov. Uh, and Chekhov is very helpful, I think, for writing about the country because his best works, I think, are all set in the countryside. Uh, the plays, obviously, you, you're familiar with uh, Uncle Vanya and the Cherry Orchard, but also uh, some of his best stories are about people 
in their middle age facing regrets, you know, which uh, having just turned 50, which is like 150 in Russian years, uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely feel, feel that a lot. So for me, that was a, a nice kind of um, um, segue uh, to reading a lot of Chekhov, taking long walks, uh, taking long, you know, in, in Chekhov, they're always going to like a bath. They always have a banya. Uh, I had a little hot tub. So I would feel very Chekhovian. And also we formed a pod with a lot of our friends. So there were our country friends. Uh, was 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 my reality, and then I called my editor and I said, you know, I'm gonna get rid of that NYU novel, and I'm just gonna try to do like the way I pitched it was Chekhov meets the Big Chill. <laughs> 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 and to my surprise, he he liked that idea, and so we were off to the races. And because I was um, writing this away from New York, only in the countryside. And because there was no, you know, I didn't go out drinking, I was able to complete this in, in record time, uh, <laughs> six months. It's never, it always takes me years to finish a book. Uh, but this time I just tore right through it because it was, uh, there wasn't much to do. Uh, and I realized that being in the country and, and being away from society is very helpful for, for a novelist. So <laughs> I, I may try to do more of that. So if you haven't had the pleasure of reading Our Country Friends, this novel follows uh, six friends and, and two others um, who aren't as closely knit, at least to the, the kind of six friends at the center, who decamp to upstate New York when the pandemic takes off um, and, and spend time forming a pod there. And um, hijinks ensue, betrayals happen. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of sex and fighting yeah. and drinking and food. Um, and it's all, it's all quite lovely and all quite <laughs> terrifying. Um, and the thing I kept thinking about as I was reading and thinking about this group of friends is the way that this novel in so many ways captured that sort of spirit of the early pandemic, mm -hmm. um, but then also was really, really focused on the sorts of relationships that so many of us, at least speaking for myself, mm -hmm. were really isolated from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you mentioned sex and food, and that's something that <laughs> occurs a lot in all of my books. Uh, um, it's full of you know, sexually frenzied gourmands, if you will. <laughs> uh, and I realized, because I teach at Columbia, I teach creative writing, uh, and also because I read a lot of books by, by 20 people in their 20s, and there's almost like a complete dearth of those things in, the, in their books. It's almost like life is lived entirely online and there's a lot of you know, angst and suffering, but also a kind of, um, I, I don't know what, how to put it, impatience, but also a lack of physicality. And whenever physicality does occur, it's always suspect. But because almost all these characters were from my generation, you know, COVID, whatever, they're gonna have sex and, 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 and eat uh, you know, buttery dishes. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so writing about that, I thought that you know that I, I wanted to make this novel. Uh, I mean, I think there's there are certain themes that that emerge from a lot of my books. One is families and immigrant families, and I think the majority of of the people in this book are immigrants from Russia, from Korea, from India. Um, another um, approach is romance. Uh, so super sad true love story, just like it says on the cover, has a love story, you know. But this, just like it says on the cover, is a book about friendship. And I've never written a book where friendship was the primary focus of the book. But that's what that's what this book is about. Because I think I think COVID made us think about our friends in a different way. All of a sudden we were isolated from them. But at the same time I felt growing closer to some of the people that we're living in Berlin or London or Los Angeles, who I don't keep up with that much, but because everyone was equidistantly distant from one another, meaning you know you pick up the phone and you talk to them as opposed to you go to Brooklyn and see them. Uh, so it reconnected me with a lot of people and made me think about friendship in a different way. And also some of the dialogue in the book came from those long conversations. So I'd be walking down my road where just like in the book, there's a sheep farm and a horses and, and all these battles between people who have you know, Trump signs and people who have hate has no home here signs. <laughs> uh, all, all that stuff is very much real and, and really influenced the book. But I was able to transcribe conversations. For example, in the book, mm -hmm. two friends talk about how they used to, in their, in their youth, uh, watch The Simpsons together. I mean, in their parents' apartments, they were young, and then talk on a you know, princess phone line 
uh, <laughs> and, and just talk about what was happening on the screen, which is obviously, well, I, I guess I have a kid. I guess he does that too, but they do it on you know on the thing. But we would lie there in bed and talk, you know. Oh my God, <laughs> I can't believe what's happening. You know. um, so all of that felt very innocent and sweet, and and made its way into the book as well. So it really is an ensemble cast. Um, the the narration kind of moves between these different characters' points of view, um, and and we get to spend really ample time in the consciousness of, of each of these characters. Um, at the center, I, I don't want to call him the protagonist, but at the mm -hmm. center of the novel is this landowner, mm -hmm. um, who is familiar, who might mm -hmm. seem have some familiar traits to those of you who have read some <laughs> of Gary's former books. He's this very Steingardian figure, yeah. um, and so and and much of your experience was being upstate, being yeah. a part of your kind yeah. of country villa, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious about like the other aspects of, of your life that made it into this novel, which is really close to, to home in many ways. Yeah, you know, when I was growing up, um, I think I had a bunch of role models, but I think one that kind of stuck was Philip Roth, who always put a Rothian doppelganger mm -hmm. into his books. Um, Zuckerman, I think, is the, the, the most well-known one. Of course, Portnoy. Portnoy and the liver, you know. Uh, <laughs> I teach that at Columbia to just complete disgust on the part of the students. Um, and I, I remember, I remember meeting Roth at my very first meeting, uh, re meeting, my first reading, uh, at a place called the Russian Samovar, and he was there. And I came up to him, and I said, "Mr. Roth, you know, you're a big. I'm so honored you're here. I'm just such a literary uh, hero for me." And he, I said, "Any advice to you know somebody with just his first book out?" And he said, "Yeah, don't eat butter." <laughs> And I asked him why, and I was standing there with my girlfriend at the time, and he very erotically explained what butter would do to my reproductive system. <laughs> uh, and that was Philip Roth, you know. <laughs> Today, he would have been very canceled. Um, so, wait, what was the question? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh, um, similarities, yeah. So, I've only been in the country full-time 10 or 11 years, but just like Sasha Sendorovsky, the, the main character, I uh, lived in a Russian bungalow colony across the river. It was recently taken over by Hasidic Jews who kind of drove it into the ground. There's nothing left of it, but it used to be kind of cool, you know, Russians running around, grandmothers chasing grandchildren with buckwheat kasha and borscht and all that. <laughs> uh, and it was the happiest times in my life because um, I didn't speak English real good back then, uh, and the grandma and the uh, kids also spoke. English with an accent, so it felt like home. Nobody would make fun of us. And we spoke like a combination of English and Russian and stuff like that. So that, that felt like a really natural home. So that's why I've always wanted to live uh, upstate and for my own little bungalow colony, which is what Sasha does completely. He has five little bungalows. I only have one little, I guess, cottage. But I've always thought, what if I had five, you know, <laughs> and I can invite five different kinds of people uh, to my cottage, to my uh, house, to my property, as <laughs> Sasha would call it. Um, but of course, that would cost a lot of money. Um, but when I was thinking of this book, I was thinking what it would be like to gather all these people together and to have someone like me as the sort of MC. Um, so I love omniscient narrators. And in this book, there, even though Sasha does take maybe center stage a little bit, I try even in the space of a paragraph or a sentence to switch points of view. That kind of omniscience I've never done before. I'm really hopping from character to character. One character is eight years old, so I'm trying to get into her point of view. At one point, I'm trying to channel a bird that lives nearby and to see you know, what the bird is thinking. Uh, there's no true villain. He well, the actor is a little bit of a villain, but the, the real villain in my own life is this groundhog we do call Steve, <laughs> Steve the groundhog, who destroys everything in sight. I mean, this he's fat as hell, I mean, because he just eats everything. He's a real bastard, and, and, I, and, I, and, and he, he has a role to play in the book as well. So living upstate, being partied in nature, et cetera, really kind of um, uh, helped me bring all these characters together. Hmm. You know, speaking of some of the, um, uh, some of the departures from your earlier work, um, you know, I, I'm thinking particularly of Super Sad True Love Story. Mm -hmm. So much of what you've written in the past has been um, in in the near future, has been yeah. in some dystopian yeah. future. But this is a really um, lived day-to-day -day experience. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's no present left. It, all, all there is is the future. You know, I think events happen so quickly that, to me, this pandemic feels like just an amuse-bouche for more horror. You know. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's a term that's been literally uh, recently coined called the trans-apocalypse, which is a very interesting thing to think, think about. It means that the apocalypse is ongoing. It's just always going to be there. It's just we'll experience peaks and troughs of it, but it's always going to be there. Uh, I did a piece in The Guardian about this, about this feeling of how I want to continue to write my books, because I know a lot of my fellow writers, they've sort of given up and said, oh, the hell with it. I can't keep up with all this crap. I'm just going to write about, you know, I'm going to write about the past. So I'm going to write about the Trump era, but, you know, it's going to be set in, I don't know, Victorian England or something. Well, not Victorian, something, you know. Um, but I am really trying to keep up with it, because I think it's important for people to understand what it was like to, you know, 100 years from now, if we still have a civilization, you know, it would be nice that somebody picked up a book and said, oh, so 2020 was when things really started to go wrong, and look at that, there's a book, and a couple of books about that exact time period. And this particular book by this Schrtengart um, <laughs> was uh, written contemporaneously, uh, which it really was. So for example, uh, the killing of Joy, uh, the murder of George Floyd is in the book, and that was written maybe two weeks after it happened, because already I could see, you know, a, a change in, in the way life upstate was lived, even though we were all sort of segregated by the pandemic. So these were all important things for me to make sure that, I mean, I don't want to be just a journalist reporting from the front lines, but at the same time, I think um, it's very difficult to write about the future, as I said before, because, for example, you mentioned Super Sad, right? That was written in 2008. Almost everything in that book has come, has come to pass. I was, uh, somebody was writing in, the, I think, again, The Guardian about, uh, in, in the book, I had a throwaway line about how, um, there's a college in, uh, in London, uh, what the hell is it called? It's the Art College, Gold, Golders, I um, can't remember the name of it. Goldsmith. Goldsmith, thank you, sir. Goldsmith, in the book, HSBC buys Goldsmith, uh, HSBC the bank, and Lloyds of London just bought Goldsmith and kicked out all these professors, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this, this was, I, I didn't think any of this would happen for like 50 years or something, but even small details like that came true, mm -hmm. not to mention the whole, uh, crap storm that social media has engendered, mm -hmm. the collapse of democracy, blah, blah, blah. Even onion skin jeans, these <laughs> transparent jeans are now a thing in Paris. So the thing is, you know, um, how do you, you know, you try to write something that'll be set 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future and it happens right under your nose. Uh, so I may as well write about the present because mm -hmm. the present is the future. So I was, I was telling Gary back in the room before we came out, I, I teach a class at Temple, I, I taught a class at Temple last year called The Very Contemporary American Novel, where the constraint of the course is we read books that have been published in the previous year. Ooh, excuse me, in the previous year. Um, and I taught this last fall, it was before um, Our Country Friends came out, so I didn't get to assign it. Mm. Um, but my class spent a good amount of time talking about really this question of partly what the pandemic novel would be, um, what it would mean for us to read a pandemic novel, to appreciate a pandemic novel, what we might experience or appreciate from that sort of novel, which then led us to this much larger conversation of what we expect of art, um, what we expect of novelists, how we expect them to interact with the world around them. Yeah. Um, and so many people in my class said, like, look, I can't deal with it. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. not interested. Just mm -hmm. give me, give me Bridgerton, yeah. give me Game of Thrones, right? Like, yeah. give me something that's purely escapist. And yet what I loved that this novel was doing was, was thinking through these questions of the contemporary in mm -hmm. ways that were neither um, massively, exclusively depressing, mm -hmm. nor... Um, nor really like saccharine or sanctimonious. Yeah, yeah, or overly sentimental, mm -hmm. which given that it's about friendship could, could very much give rise to that. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's interesting. I think, I think that to me, a novel still has to entertain. I don't think that it's just a, a purely intellectual exercise. Um, some people have spoken of my novels that they have attributes of novels of ideas, but I, I don't set out with that in mind. I want to actually have People read something and like it and laugh. You know, if you're not laughing, I'm not really doing my job. Uh, so I've always factored that in. And the way you do it is sort of the way uh, a photographer changes her uh, wide angle lens and you know, is able to zoom in and out. So the, the tr horrific events that happen in all of my books, um, Super Sad is about technology, uh, Lake Success was about finance, uh, Absurdistan was about oil politics. Um, all of that is in the distance, it's happening. But the characters mostly care about, you know, oh, does someone like me? Uh, or, ooh, am I going to get that Vitello Tonato tonight? You know, <laughs> I hope somebody makes that. Uh, or, or, you know, now that there's a child involved, you know, how do I take care of this child? 
who has certain issues, but at the same time, you know, um, is isolated and has to do Zoom classes and all that. I mean, these are all the personal issues that everyone faces, but at the, at the other part of it is all these immigrants are sitting around thinking, Jesus Christ, our parents brought us to this country to be safe, and now this doesn't feel safe at all, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so their world has been completely turned around, and now they're the sort of, they're thinking about emigrating elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that is important, but also the fact that the interplay between them is to me the most important part, because I could have said that, I, I could take those eight friends and take them out of COVID and I would still have a novel. Uh, the COVID is the, you know, the gravy on top, if you will. Mm -hmm. So all of these friends are, most all of them are immigrants. Yeah. Um, many of them are artists in some way, shape, or form, trying to kind of think through this question of what, what is left for them, yeah. what, what, how can they engage in, in particular ways. And I'm so interested in the ways, we can stop talking about COVID if you all want, because it is pretty depressing. Um, but I'm really interested in the ways in which this novel is thinking through um, other questions uh, of, of 2020 through 2022, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about its engagement with privilege in yeah, particular. Yeah, yeah, and again, in a way that's not overly sanctimonious, mm -hmm. but is really, I think, um, encapsulating a particular moment where this is a, a very active right. daily part of our conversation. Well, it's very, I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, privilege is funny to write about because mm -hmm. privilege is, I don't know, it's just funny because nobody thinks that, well, few people think they're privileged. Uh, I know billionaires, because I, I, when I was doing Lake Success, I was researching billions who think they're really downtrodden. Uh, mm -hmm. And are just so angry that there's, you know, there's people with 10 billion as opposed to their one single lonely billion, uh, <laughs> and their G4 plane as opposed to their the latest G9 or whatever the hell, or is that an iPhone? I don't even know. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, I, I had a lot of fun with that kind of dialogue. But a lot of the book also, and I love writing dinner scenes. I think I've always been good at dinner scenes, especially with a lot of people. So. Um, so there's a lot of dinner scenes in here, and uh, there's one dinner scene where there's this woman who's, I don't know, she's like 29, her name is D. Cameron, which for purely <laughs> literary nerds may remind you of the thing, the D. Cameron, um, the, 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 the old uh, novel by, uh, but, uh, what's his name? Focaccia. Oh, uh, I almost said focaccia. I guess, <laughs> I guess I'm hungry. Yeah, focaccia wrote a woof. <laughs> Maron, that was a good novel. Um, um, so yeah, I love dinner scenes, and there's a dinner scene where <laughs> this woman's very angry because uh, she's just been canceled and, uh, on Twitter, and she's trying to make everyone else feel bad, and, she, and there's some really rich people there, and she starts talking about, okay, everyone has to write down their net worth on a napkin and then fold it and then pass it over to me, and then somebody asks, well, what's your net worth? And she says, well, it's only $290,000. And somebody says, for, for a 29-year-old, that's actually a lot of money. You know, but she, it never occurred to her that that could be the case. So I really enjoyed kind of thinking about, because living in the center of Manhattan uh, is wonderful for that kind, of, uh, that kind of, I mean, I remember when my kid was applying to uh, schools, and I was talking to the wife of a, of a hedge fund billionaire, and she suggested that I apply to ethical culture, this one school. And I said, uh, why ethical culture? And she said, because it's so diverse. And I said, I've been by it, there's, I think everyone's white in there. And she said, no, I mean, s economically, some of these dads are just doctors or lawyers. <laughs> you know? So th that's always the case, you know, that nobody thinks they're privileged and I, I don't know, it's just, there's a lot of humor to be uh, drawn out of that, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when I teach Chekhov, I, I, I'm an Americanist, so mm -hmm. I don't get to teach his plays, but I do teach his short stories mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm reading all the blurbs. I'm reading here uh, the Washington Post blurb on the cover that says this is Chekhov. Um, and so I'm approaching this. Mm -hmm. I, I read the dramatis personae at the front, and I'm waiting for this actor gun to go off mm -hmm. yeah. um, because of the way that he's, he's listed here at the front, the way that his, his arrival is so breathlessly yeah. anticipated. Yeah. Um, and now you've worked in TV a little bit, so I'm, I'm curious yeah. about the actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, that's the question I get the most when I'm when I'm doing readings. Who is the actor? Yeah. You know, because I've been associated with some big name actors, uh, and I can never reveal who it is. But it is a person, though. It is well, someone it's, or it, an amalgam. Yeah, of, it's an amalgam of people. of people with one person specifically sticking out. It's funny when when people in L.A. read it, mm -hmm. you know, who work in the industry, and they're like, "Oh, it's," and I'm like, "I can't say, but wink, wink," you know. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I do a lot of work for shows like uh, like Succession and, and stuff like that, and I, I really enjoy it. I mean, it's it's fun, and it's, I gotta say, compared to writing a novel, it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Interior day, you know, as opposed to he walked into a room, the slanted sunlight hit the, you know. 
all the descriptions. It's like interior day, woman, 30s, you know. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> We're off. Um, but I enjoy, one thing I, I'm always amazed at is, you know, in America we don't have a monarchy and a, a, an aristocratic baronial class, I guess. Or maybe we do, but not officially. But I think sort of actors fill in in that way. So I remember I was doing a project with Ben Stiller and... Um, in Westwood in Hollywood in uh, LA and uh, I, I love In-N-Out burgers when I'm in California so I said hey can we you know we we're talking about it. I said do you mind I'm starving can we just drop by and we walked in and like the whole world froze you know <laughs> and everything stopped and the owner came out and he was just he, he was from some other part of the world and he was like crying and you know like just take whatever you want for free <laughs> take my daughter and just <laughs> all that's mine is yours you know so I realized that there's a kind of both privilege there, but also it's an, it's annoying as hell, you know, because you can't, you have to give up the idea that you're ever going to live without being sort of mediated through this lens of, of I don't know. I mean, this again, we don't have monarchy, so this is as close almost as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, and now I know that all that whole world has been shaken up by YouTube and TikTok and all this other stuff, but it, it, so there are many more minor celebrities than there are gigantic celebrities, but um, for the actor, I really enjoyed kind of putting together a person from the many I know who are both incredibly um, imperious in a way and think the world does revolve around them, which it sort of does, you know, they're not wrong, mm -hmm. um, but also I think have great insecurities. So I've had dialogue like at one point the actor, so the actor and Sasha are trying to create a play together and the actor says to him, you know, uh, you don't know anything about subtext. And, and, and Sasha, who teaches at a Columbia-like institution, says, but I teach a graduate course on subtext. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's all taken from, from real life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're all kind of, everything gets bought all the time. Uh, so, you know, um, things always move ahead. And then someone's like, I don't know, this is a little too much, you know. <laughs> but yeah, this is optioned and the script is being prepared as we speak, but you know, it doesn't mean it'll be made. Um, um, yeah, it's weird because I do work on, on things that get made, but never mind. <laughs> but well, it's, I hope so because this actually is, I mean, when it comes to um, uh, making a film or TV, the big question is what's the budget, right? And here it's all one house in the country. It's very easy to do this. Uh, so this has, I think, a little bit more chance. The aesthetics get so visual. Yeah, no. Yeah, I do write very visually. I love TV as a medium, not just because I work on it sometimes, but because I watch it, a lot of it. Um, because you know why, and I'll tell you, sorry, now we're getting on a tangent, but I find that TV reminds me more of a kind of more linear, it's not always linear, but kind of a plot-based stuff than a lot of contemporary fiction. And I'm not sort of saying I hate experimental stuff because sometimes it's absolutely wonderful. Um, thank God we have Don DeLillo. But um, at the same time, I find that a lot of TV, weirdly enough, satiates my need for novels because it's taken so much good temp television, such as, I don't know, The Wire, for example, set in nearby Baltimore. It takes such an episodic novelistic approach, right? that it almost feels like, okay, uh, this season is chapter four, you know, or something like that. Um, so yes, I do have a, a, a lot of connection to, uh, to that kind of for, format, which is maybe why, why you're noticing that it's visual, you know. Dobry wieczór. Dobry wieczór. Um, I'm um, sharing your background. I enjoy your books very much. Thank you. Um, considering that we share the same uh, upbringing from the Soviet Union, yeah. what is your, um, vision as to what life would be like if you never immigrated <laughs> and um, where your career would take you and also what are your worries about uh, where this country is going considering our background? This country or? This country. This country, yeah. Thank you for asking. Those are very good questions. Um, well, I would hope I would have been an oligarch, right, if I stayed. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> But they were all like, you know, they had PhDs in chemistry and weird stuff. A lot of them, the, the initial 90s group, and I, I suck at math or in science. <laughs> I went to Stuyvesant, but I barely graduated in, in New York. Um, I don't know. I, I think that society would have crushed me, honestly. I don't think there would have been much hope. And I know that writers don't. I mean, I've met, what's his name, uh, a few times, um, Sorokin. Um, 
he's done well for himself, but he's one of the few. There's very few writers that, that you know. Oh, Tolstoy I've met a couple of times. You know, and, and then I've been banned from going back to Russia because of some of my criticism of Putin. So I was stopped, luckily, at the airport in America before getting on a, uh, an airline formerly owned by Berezovsky, I can't remember, trans Ira or something like that in the old days. Uh, so I haven't been allowed back in. So I've been actually going to Ukraine because that's the one country where people like me, or at least, you know, I'm allowed in. Um, even though I'm from Leningrad. It's, it's, and that is its own complexity because two of my grandparents were from Ukraine. Uh, and in fact, one emigrated, well, emigrated, one left Ukraine for Leningrad in the late 30s and then was killed fighting to defend Leningrad from the fascists, and then <laughs> 10 years later, another fascist was born in exactly the city that he defended, Vladimir Putin I'm talking about. So uh, a lot of complexity, but the lens, putting the lens on this country is very scary for me because um, when a country began to lose its sense of cohesiveness, its sense of mission, I mean, Soviet-style socialism was never that cohesive to begin with, you know, it was always very problematic, but, you know, by the time my parents, the Brezhnev years, the stagnation, all that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes I, I do wonder about, and also the propaganda. You know, I have relatives who watch Russian state TV and then Fox, and they won't get vaccinated, for example, because both things tell them not to do that. So there's a lot of weird correlations between some of the far right and some of the stuff that's coming out of, of Russia, Russia particularly. Um, compared to the other republics. Um, whereas Ukraine was, when I would go to Ukraine, it would be the, one of those, it, it was a strange feeling of hearing Russian because in a city like Kiev, back then at least, you would hear more Russian than Ukrainian. Now I think that's changing. At least my friends tell me that, that they're hearing more Ukrainian for obvious reasons. But to be in a city that's free, you know, where people have rights and to hear Russian all over the place is, is very strange because that's not, that wasn't my experience when I would go back to Petersburg, which is a lovely city, but where, um, you would feel this oppression, this thing lowering on you. I have a very strong kind of barometer when I'm in a free society and, and when I'm in one that's not free. So, yeah, I'm really scared, honestly. Uh, we, we've been, uh, you know, feeling out different, and, and also scared because I have a, a, an eight-year-old kid. Um, if I didn't have a kid, I could tough it out, but, um, you know, the one really smart thing my parents knew what to do was when to get out. Um, they, they made a lot of mistakes in their lives, but that was the smartest thing they did was, you know, they said, oh, we have a way to get out, we can leave. So I was just in Ireland and they said, you know, we need more Jews here, so can you please, uh, <laughs> can you please come? And especially Jews who can drink like you. So <laughs> that, that may be my next stop. You know. I have to say, when one of your characters, Ed, started talking about the golden passports, I very quickly started Googling. Oh, yeah, the golden passports, yeah. <laughs> I realized this was well outside of my reach, but it was a, a very useful piece Yeah, of you can buy, I mean, Russians have now been denied those, but yeah, you can buy a, a Malta is especially looking for more Ireland. citizens, Ireland, Portugal, some nice countries, <laughs> nice sunny places. Good to think about if you mm -hmm. uh, come from that particular background. Yeah, if you have a particular background, please, please <laughs> come. Yeah. Do you have any of your books translated into Russian? Yeah, so I used to have them, they were all translated into Russian, and then... Um, then after I was, became sort of persona non grata there, they magically stopped. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry um, to hear One, this, this was bought by a very small publisher. I used to be published by some of the big sort of, um, in fact, the biggest publisher I think is owned by one of Putin's buddies. Uh, I can't remember the name. Um, but, and then they stopped publishing, of course. And then um, this one was bought, and then it was supposed to come out, but after the war, it hasn't come out yet, so. Yeah. Yeah. Just very quickly, so what are your expectations if an ordinary Russian reader have your book in their hands? What yeah. would they think to you know, learn from your book? <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, it's a good question. Uh, it's a question a lot of writers ask when they come from some other place and they're trying to figure out you know, what relationship they still have to, their, to the, their, the country of their birth or their home. Um, when, I, when my books were published, a lot of the reviews were kind of angry in that, well, especially when I wrote a lot about Russia in books like Absurdistan, uh, because the reviewers would say, well, he doesn't even live here, but he makes fun of us. You know, there was a kind of petulant, you know, it's fine to live here and suffer like we do, but, and then you can write about it. But, you know, off, there he is in his little dacha upstate, and he's making fun of us. That hurts. Um, and I think there's, a, there's but, but some people really got it, too. Um, 
so I enjoyed actually going back to, well, to Moscow and Petersburg. Russia is so <laughs> focused on two cities uh, and to give readings there and stuff. And um, look, there was a lovely intelligentsia. They're all now living in Yerevan and Tbilisi. Uh, they've all, le or not all, but many of them have left. But uh, it always felt like a very precarious place. Um, and, you know, and I would, we would have conversations like this about what one can. It used to be that writing not novels were sort of okay because the Kremlin didn't really care so much. They were, you know, it was a small thing compared to, I mean, the main thing was possession of the main networks. Um, so this was a little sideline that the, you know, the government was like, ah, publish whatever the hell you want. And you could write very, very openly in a way that you couldn't write, say, about the Soviet regime during the Soviet Union. Uh, but I also noticed, I mean, I remember my books came out in China and I remember a, a, a Mandarin speaking friends telling me that a lot of them were very, uh, a lot of stuff was taken out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was interesting what they said was, it was the stuff that was critical of Russia that often got taken out, mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting because, you know, Russia is China's little buddy, the Sancho Panza to, <laughs> to China's Don Quixote. Um, so it's like they didn't want to piss Russia off, even though that didn't, I mean, you know, or they didn't want Chinese readers to think that Russia was a joke, as it is. So, yeah, the idea of what gets translated and what doesn't is, is very fascinating. I obviously can't read uh, uh, Mandarin, but, um, uh, but in Russian I could, I could see that they would translate everything because it didn't really matter. But now it does, now it does. We have another question down here, but I, I was thinking, uh, in response to, to this question too, that's really a central concern for the majority of, of the characters in this book too, is, is thinking through their relationship to their country of origin. So it might be a concern for you as a writer, but also the, the characters of your novel are also really centrally. Well, it, this is really interesting. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's a good point too. So, you know, my child, um, my wife's Korean American, so the child has those two cultures. Mm -hmm. And when we were starting out, my wife said, well, he's got to learn both, Russian and Korean. And I, I thought, you know, Someday he'll go to Korea, and Korea is, and, and the, the pop group B, BTS takes up a <laughs> huge part of this novel. I'm sorry if you don't like Korean pop, K-pop. Um, <laughs> but Korea is a country that's completely focused, open to the world, is actually exporting cultural things, uh, is making the best movies and TV series and things like that. And Russia gives nothing to the world at this point. Even, occasionally there's a great movie like Leviathan, which is now also being censored. But, you know, I would rather him learn, if he's going to learn one language, I would rather learn Korean. And my wife said, but of course, the cultural heritage of Russia, etc. And that absolutely makes sense. I, I, I do want him to read Chekhov in the original someday. Absolutely. But so she kind of went over and we sent our kid to a, um, a Russian school, which also taught Mandarin. And it is where Jared and Ivanka sent their kids <laughs> to get educated. And the whole school, it was on the Upper East Side, it looked really, there was something a little off about it. And I decided to sit in on one of the um, lessons. And it was a young woman in her 20s, very pretty, all the you know, four-year-old kids loved her. And I noticed she was wearing, um, it's Grigorev's um, Caliente, it's like, um, it's, it basically says you identify with the seizure of Crimea, but also with the far right. And now it's used in, with, along with the Z symbol as a um, symbol of, 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 and she was talking about it was the day of the great patri victory in the great patriotic war. And she was talking, telling these three or four year olds about how we all have to pledge allegiance to Vladimir Putin. And this is, you know, this is our government too, and all this stuff. So I called my friend Masha Gessen, who some of you may know, and she was like, get him out of there right away, you know. <laughs> So that was our attempt to do Russian studies in, in New York. You know? <laughs> Even that was somehow politicized and Putinized, and you know. So it's it's a uh, it's really depressing. I like I love you know. I don't want to say that don't you know keep away from Russian culture, but at the same time I want to say you know read read more books by great current Ukrainian writers. Um, my friend uh, Andrei Kurkov who. Is from Kiev, and I, we just welcomed him at, uh, in Pen America. Great book called uh, Gray Bees, I think is the title in English. And uh, really, it talks about this, this war. It was written in the interim between Russia's invasion in 2014 of Crimea and, and, and Donbass region and, and contemporary, uh, the contemporary invasion. So lots of good stuff, too. So I think it's important for people to spread their, um, their knowledge of that region and just not, not just stick to, to Russian mm -hmm. stuff. Um, just to go back to this question of um, 
of writing about the future and the present and so forth. Um, I was really interested to read your book because I wanted to read a pandemic book and mm -hmm. see how people were writing about it. But by the time I read it, you had written about sort of an earlier stage of the pandemic, so it felt a little, yeah. bit, a bit, little bit like a period piece, which you've sort of said. You, you, yeah. you, and so is that, were you thinking about that when you wrote yeah. it, or did that become apparent <laughs> you know, after it was written? You know what's funny is that uh, I remember getting tweets like, um, yeah, I just read Our Country Friends, and it made me really nostalgic for Pandemic 1.0. <laughs> because I'm, I, Omicron is just not sitting well with me. Uh, but you know, but that was, that's the other strange thing. And this brings privilege into the equation, because those of us who were immigrants and who had second homes also felt bad because the most affected parts of New York, at least, I don't know how it was in Philly, were Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, parts of Queens, where there's a lot of service workers, a lot of healthcare workers. And that's where we came from. That's where we grew up. And you know, had we come now, that's where we'd be instead of in our lovely you know, uh, upstate dachas. So that's something that haunted, haunts the, um, the characters, but also, I think, affected me. Yeah. Um, million, a million people died or more, uh, partly because of governmental incompetence, partly because when you have a virus that's, that's what, this severe, that's what's going to happen. Um, but it, it did feel like a different way of living, which I think has, I think Omicron, et cetera, we, you know, if I, I wore a mask for a little bit and then I took it off and then I would wear it again because some of my friends were sick and stuff like that. But uh, that was the first truly incredible blow that we haven't had really since 1918 on that scale, you know, where, where we had the, uh, where we had that, uh, that pandemic. So I think for a writer, it was hard not to think about writing it, but a lot of writers wrote sort of preemptive essays. My very good friend Sloan Crosley wrote an essay just as I was starting my book saying, you know, if anyone writes a pandemic novel, they're a schmuck, you know. <laughs> uh, and then my very first reading in New York, uh, she was my, uh, my interlocutor, uh, which was funny, you know. <laughs> I brought the thing and I was like, <laughs> I believe you said. Um, but again, I, I also I understand what she mean, what she would mean by something like that, because I think it's true. It, it's very risky to do something like that. And I remember my British publishers saying, at the, you know, we don't want to publish this because we're worried that the pandemic will be over, nobody will care. Uh, so another publisher there published it and did pretty well, I think. Um, because I think it's weird, like, you know, like that tweet. I think some people do have a strange nostalgic feeling. For example, many families were brought a lot closer. Um, I was talking about, because I know all these hedge funders because I wrote Lake Success, you know, their children never knew them or saw them, you know, and their wives hated them, you know, and so, but through this thing, you know, they were stuck in just 12,000 square feet worth of space, uh, <laughs> and they had to get to know each other, and, and the one maid who remained, um, yeah. My so, daughter was so. born the first month of the pandemic. Oh my God. And so it was oh my God. a nightmare. But it, I, I feel that, like a sense of nostalgia for this like particular right. moment in the world, but also this particular moment in my life. And it's hard to separate that, that nostalgia from also this horror. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's, you know, obviously every relationship between the mother and, and, and child is very, is very intense and personal, but that this probably was even more so because there was, you couldn't, you know, Oh, hand it over to your husband and hand the kid over to your husband and go for gelato because yeah. you couldn't go over for gelato. You right. know? I could hand her over and then go sit on the other chair. On the other chair. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my options. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get another pandemic going, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get a bat and a pig together one more time or whatever it was. Well, um, thank you. I loved your book. I thank have you. a literary question. True. Um, I was surprised by this. Chekhovian references because in Chekhov's play hardly anything happens right, right externally right, right. And, <laughs> and whatever damage happens people sort of inflict it upon themselves right and in your novel okay one one person dies from COVID we but, won't say who but, <laughs> but right but sorry spoiler alert spoiler alert, alert. <laughs> uh, but you know other crazy things happen is it does that happen because of COVID or this hap would have happened to them anyway Mm -hmm. Marsha, an actor, yeah. and all these things. You know, you 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 me you mentioned that um, COVID is, which we spend a lot of time talking mm -hmm. about. It's almost superficial. Mm -hmm. Do you think the same thing would have happened if it wasn't COVID, or no. how much so, of it is internal and how much of it is right? External? Right, that's a good question. Yeah, no, I think you're right. No, <laughs> it's not a hundred percent Chekhovian. Uh, it's Chekhovian with pulp, as it would say in a on an orange juice bottle. Um, 
It's true. In Chekhov, you know, everyone gets together, they talk about something, then everyone leaves, and everyone's disappointed, and, you know, crying into their bosom or their handkerchief and saying, you know, well, we must go on. You know, what can we do? Let's, let's go on. Um, and I love that about Chekhov, the fact that nothing huge needs to happen. Uh, you know, um, a, a school teacher is, is, you know, takes a carriage ride into the center of town to collect her salary. She gets stuck in the ravine. She gets unstuck. Off she goes, you know. <laughs> she meets some peasants, uh, surfs up. Uh, um, but that's it. Um, this is also an American novel, so some horrible things do have to happen uh, beyond just general, general disappointment. When I said, you know, Chekhov meets the Big Chill, which is a movie that came out in the 80s, uh, that movie begins with a, with a dead body. Um, somebody has committed suicide, and seven or eight friends are gathered together to sort of talk about that, and then various things happen between them. So it's almost like a it's like this book, but in reverse. It starts with a death, and then it moves on. Um, is COVID, yeah, COVID, and there's also an algorithm, a love potion at play. Mm -hmm. So I would say if we're talking about literary references, maybe we can throw in a little bit of Shakespeare, where a lot of things happen in his plays. You know, uh, Yeah, tons of things happen. Uh, Julius Caesar gets stabbed, and etc. So here I was thinking maybe more of A Midsummer's Night Dream, because it features a love mm -hmm. potion. Mm -hmm. But the love potion here is um, brought up to date, so now it's an algorithm that makes you fall in love with somebody else, which I think I picked up. I mean, I'm one of the, I'm lucky enough that I, I'm old enough that I didn't meet someone through Blender or Tender or whatever the <laughs> hell it's called. Because um, I get to read a lot of this stuff from my students in, in Colombia, and it seems like, I don't know, somebody wrote once that uh, my generation is like, we're the last helicopter lifting off of the Saigon Embassy. We, we, we didn't get to, we got to actually meet people in live and, and instead of on some app. Uh, but I wanted to update that and have that become a huge protagonist because that obviously the whole, um, everything gets changed by that, that, by that love potion and then also by the external force of COVID. So yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good thing to point out that it's not, it's not really structured in a, in a way of a Chekhovian play, or even one of the great uh, stories by Chekhov set in the country, like, uh, oh, in the bathhouse, about, about love, uh, the man in the shell, et cetera. Yeah. Part of what I also loved about this novel um, is the other things that were happening in 2020 that are happening in the background of this novel that you also um, allowed to influence your characters but did not take up in the same way, right? So you mentioned that George, the, mm -hmm. uh, George Floyd's murder was... Uh, a major part of the novel, yeah. um, but it's not the focus of the novel. And so I, I also loved the way that you let those things lie yeah. in some point. Yeah. We are still waiting for our great Black Lives Matter novel. Right. Um, and perhaps someone else will write it. And perhaps yeah. someone else will write it. And, and people have written novels that are about themes that are mm -hmm. a, a Black Lives Matter, but without sort of specifying, making that organization the, or that movement, rather, mm -hmm. the center of it. Yeah, I would say this, that um, as George Floyd, as that was happening, as, and as the protests mounted, my thought was that it would obviously have an impact, but that it would also, that especially privileged people like the ones described in this book would, would move on. Mm -hmm. And also, and, and that, I think, you know, my friends who are part of the movement tell me that that's essentially what happened, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, how many years, two years after George Floyd's murder is, people think about it, but not a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and people vaguely talk about it, but the privileged people have already moved on. Mm -hmm. um, it's people who can actually be affected by a murder like that in their own personal lives that, that have to live with it. So when I was thinking about what the place would be for these characters, I was also thinking that each character would maybe reflect on their privilege, et cetera, but also not do anything about it. And in the end, and almost start to think, well, how does this benefit me? Or how does this hurt me? Which I love following Twitter. Um, I mean, I, I, it's destroyed my life, but I also enjoy it very much. So please follow me on Twitter, <laughs> at Steingart, um, and Instagram. So, <laughs> but it was interesting because I, I kind of felt that a lot of the people I knew were positioning themselves in a way to, you know, to have something important to say. Maybe I was one of those people, I don't know. Uh, but in a way to sort of project their own brand a little bit more, you know. <laughs> And also other people got canceled, you know, which was even more fun to watch uh, and also has uh, a part in, in, the, in the book. So all of that stuff, I, I, I didn't want the book to be about social media because as I mentioned, so many books I, I, I read now are almost entirely about someone walking through, you know, looking at their phone. I didn't want that. 
Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I couldn't have that be ignored because I think during uh, the pandemic, people started looking at social media a lot more than, than previously, and I think that had a very bad effect on our, on our democracy, to be honest. I think people became even more siloed in uh, and even less capable of any empathy. I'm so curious, like how many of your students, and I, I love her, but I'm so curious how many of your students are trying to be Patricia Lockwood, right? Are trying oh, yeah, to kind yeah, of work through yeah, this internet space. Yeah, I, it's interesting. Yeah, I think they're all trying to be Sally Rooney. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I like her a lot too. Yeah, I, I like her too. Yeah. And considering that there was a horrible anti-Semitism in Russia, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you've ever encountered something similar in the United States now that you've mentioned Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter and you care very much about other other causes, how did it affect you in America? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think, and I'm what, 50, and I came here at uh, seven, so I'm bad at math, many years. Um, I've only been, I've only heard an anti-Semitic word said once in my 43 years here, and it was said by uh, a Philadelphian. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and he quickly apologized, he didn't even notice it. Uh, but I think that's part of his, uh, you know, the way he speaks. And, but, you know, that was the one time that happened. Now, when I go back to Russia, it's, you know, <laughs> it's a, a wonder, there's always some uh, drunk on the pavement being like, oh, that is one bearded Jew walking down the street, you know, and things like that. Um, so I have not encountered a lot of anti-Semitism personally. Does it exist? Sure, of course it does. And, and is it more, pre would I notice it more if I lived in not Manhattan, right, uh, but somewhere else? Um, you know, I don't want to pick the South as an example, but perhaps there it obviously would, would be more important, uh, would be more of a factor of my life. But one thing I can say is that I really enjoy the brand of sort of Judaism I have, which is the cultural part of it without the religious part. I mean, I think the most difficult part of my life was the eight years I spent in Hebrew school because I, <laughs> that was not good. Uh, that was really not good. Um, Maybe that's when I showed up at Stuyvesant like I didn't know any math or science because that was, it was all Talmud all the time. Um, but boy, am I good with the Talmud. Uh, but I think I have more of a Larry David approach to Judaism where the Yiddishisms pour out of me, you know, nonstop. I've written about circumcision lately. I don't know if any of you have seen that article. Yeah, you've seen it, yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's become a big subject for me, the subject of circumcision. Uh, and uh, I'm actually putting on a one-man show, uh, I think about next year, we're working on the, oh, wow. on the show. Yeah, I love doing performative stuff, and this is be, on the stage it'll be me and this big dancing penis. Of <laughs> So you're just becoming the actor. Correct? Yeah, I am becoming the actor. I love, <laughs> I love acting, and I, I, I just did a, a thing for, for New York Times uh, where I had to play a, 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 an Orthodox priest, of all things, um, wearing that big yellow thing and the whole... Uh, so I, I do love acting quite a bit. Oh, Your YouTube shorts for all the books that are just, I mean, phenomenal. And I have a friend who's a writer, and she was like, we need to... We need to channel this. Like yeah. her, her person was like they needed a short, and, and <laughs> one day we just watched them all, and they were just. Amazing, so. Thank you. Yeah, I do these <laughs> shorts. I, this is the first book I, I didn't have a trailer for because of COVID, uh, but uh, I've done shorts for almost all the other books, uh, and they star like Ben Stiller and James Franco and uh, uh, Paul Giamatti and all these wonderful. So yeah, you just put in Steingarten book trailer, and, and you'll find them. Uh, and one, I, I get to make out with uh, James Franco for a while, which was <laughs> So all the people incredible. who might show up in yeah. the adaptation of this book. Yeah, I'm really well, they're all welcome to, to this, <laughs> to the casting. Um, <laughs> absolutely. So the trailers were really fun. And, and, and again, you know, I'm talking about how I, I worked in TV and film. And, and for me, that kind of being able to make that jump is just so much fun. Um, yeah, this is kind of the golden age of all that stuff. There's really great, as they call it, content. There's, there's really wonderful content out there. Um, the interesting thing I would say is that people are very much, everything's been chopped into little bits. So there's no, people talk about, you know, the great novelists that we used to have who every single person read. And, and that rarely exists anymore, you know. 
Uh, and the same thing with television. You know, it used to be a, a hit show would be 30 million people. My friend who works in TV said, in the old days, if you had a sitcom on and, and it was an audience of less than 30 million, you were canceled. Now HBO is like happy with one million people watching Girls or something. You know, so it's very different. We're all kind of little tribes now, and when it comes to, to creative outlets, and that's good in some ways. You know, that we have our little things, but it also makes for a cu culture that is incredibly fragmented. Well, if uh, you did not have your fill of Gary this evening, now you have a good homework assignment, which is to go find his book trailers. Um, They're funny, I gotta say. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us this yeah. evening, and let's thank, let's thank Gary Steingart. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll sign anything, so yeah. <laughs> Asthma inhalers.